Watch out for that wall. It does funky things. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect, and today on the Guts of CFD, we are going to discuss near wall effects. That is, how do we handle turbulence near the wall? The wall is the term that we use to refer to any time we are near a solid object in our CFD simulation. Turbulence does funny things near the wall, so let's get into it. To understand the wall, you need to understand the law of the wall. This is an actual physical phenomenon that we have recorded from physical measurements and experiments. You see, when you look at how turbulent behavior happens, we notice that there's actually a laminar sublayer as you get close to the wall of any, of any object. That is to say, as you get close to the physical surface of an object, there's a laminar sublayer. And what's actually happening, you see, turbulence happens when particles switch places. Or, well, not really switch places, but when they jump lanes. A slow moving particle jumps to a fast moving particle. And as you get closer and closer to the wall, there just isn't actually that much of a distance to jump that large of a movement. And so as you get close, you can jump less of a distance. And so there's not much of a change in velocity for that particle to jump across. And so you get, you switch from turbulent to laminar because of that lack of distance change. That's where that laminar sublayer comes from. Every physical medium has this laminar sublayer in its boundary layer. And keep in mind, when you're trying to visualize this, we're talking really, really tiny. We're talking right on down to super, super, super tiny levels here, not more than a, maybe a millimeter above the surface of any solid object. So we're very small, but that small distance matters. The reason it matters is because when we start to model this in CFD, how does our turbulence model handle it? Our turbulence model says things are turbulent everywhere, even in that little one millimeter gap. Ooh, well that's a bit of a problem. Well, thankfully the CFD guys have already solved this. They've put in things called wall functions that handle that and actually make that a laminar sublayer. So that, And I'm going to explain how that works for you. But it's important you understand that because they've given you options in how to handle this laminar sublayer, and your selection of how you handle the sublayer also affects how you decide how to mesh that region of your boundary layer. Now, how do we measure that distance away from our boundary? Well, Y plus, of course. Y plus is the non-dimensional measurement of distance from the wall. That is our first cell thickness. Uh, most CFD sim solvers actually have just a function that you can click to get a plot of Y plus. And the reason we want it non-dimensional is because it gives us some pretty consistent numbers. So if you're talking a Y plus of between 10 and 20, that's going to be your laminar sublayer. And actually even anything lower is of course also your laminar sublayer. If you're talking a Y plus of 30 to probably 60, that's going to be your turbulent boundary layer and anything above that is also going to be turbulent as well. So now that we know those Y plus distances and we know their significance, let's think about how that feeds into our meshing strategies and how do we treat that with our turbulence. Well, all of that sounds great, but how do you actually get that first cell height to get the Y plus that you want? Eh, you kind of have to take a guess, honestly. It depends on the flow velocity right at that point in the, the shape, which changes with your body shape. Um, you're going to be able to estimate the wall shear stress with some sort of empirical formula. For a ship, I tend to use the Schoner flat plate formula, but in, in the end, it's a bit of a guess and check method. So you're always going to check your Y plus when you're doing your post-processing. And remember the numbers that you're looking for are that 10 to 20, that's a laminar sublayer, that 30 to 60 or plus, that's a turbulent boundary layer. So how does this affect our meshing strategy? Well, how does the turbulent model handle the wall? They can typically give you two options depending on your solver. You can either have a wall function or a wall damping function. Those are two very different options. In a wall function, what it's actually going to do 
is it's going to assume that the entire laminar sublayer is entirely within that first cell thickness. And it's going to integrate that entire laminar sublayer within that first cell. So that whole thing gets treated slightly differently than all of your other cells. That's what a wall function does. And you're going to apply that when you have your target Y plus is probably around 80 on your body. You want at least a minimum of 40. You notice how I'm leaving myself a bit of a safety margin there compared to the Y plus that I said for the boundary values here. I said that the turbulent boundary layer starts at around a Y plus of 30. And I'm saying here that you really want to have your minimum Y plus of at least 40. Notice I'm leaving myself a pretty wide margin there. And that's because you're going to get variations in your mesh. Your mesh isn't going to be perfect everywhere. So that's what I'm doing there for these recommendations. Of course, if you don't like these numbers, if you want to hone them in better, do a validation study, come up with your own. The second option is a wall damping function. This one is going to be where you're actually really putting in a very detailed mesh and you're actually meshing in and resolving that entire laminar sublayer. So for that one, you really want a detailed Y plus. You want a Y plus of probably 2.5, you maximum of 12. You're going to want to resolve and get every single detail of that Y plus in there. What happens with the wall damping function is that it doesn't actually integrate the entire laminar sublayer. It actually just damps out turbulence within that region and it just leaves it to normal laminar viscosity. So those are two different behaviors, two totally different meshing strategies, and it all depends on how thick is your first cell thickness. Are you meshing within your sublayer or are you putting your entire sublayer just within your first cell thickness? So remember those two strategies, remember how you're handling your wall. And that covers turbulence and near wall effects. So to review, we've gone over Navier-Stokes equations, transport equations, finite volume interpolation, linear solution, and pretty well covered turbulence now. We've just done the, realize that turbulence, we're doing an averaging effect. That's what RAND stands for. Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes. We know that the K-omega shear stress transport model, K-omega SST, that's probably the best model to start with for turbulence models. And we have now understood the near wall effects, how the pick between a wall function and a wall damping function really depends on what our meshing strategy is. Hope this has helped you out. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more videos. And did you know that we produce more than just videos at DMS? Check out our website to find more articles, free downloads, and other help with ship design. We offer a host of engineering services for budgets large and small. So check us out to see if we can make your next project easier.